Please stand for our reading from the gospel. We are reading from Luke 2, verses 24 to 34. This is taking place um, during the uh, Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples in the upper room. A dispute also arose among them, that's among the disciples, the twelve, as to which of them was considered to be greatest. Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that the words of my mouth and the reflections of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please go ahead and be seated. So um, during 2020, there was a meme that showed up. Uh, meme are these little uh, fun things online on social media. And, uh, oh, I'm just trying to see if I can control this on air, but it doesn't look like I can, so I'm going to have Sam move this forward for me. And these are uh, pictures that showed up, and they went along. The, the idea of it, the basic concept, was this. The basic concept is how it started how it's going. So I think I've got it now, Sam. So you can see from here that uh, the basic concept shows the passage of time through oppositional bookends. They remember journeys. So there were a lot of them here for like relationships. People would show themselves at the beginning of their relationship and then show where the relationship was going. Uh, they would do it with their children, how it started, how it's going, kind of catch you up on that. Even, you know, athletes got into it after the World Cup. ESPN puts how it started with Mbappe and how it's going with that World Cup trophy. Uh, even uh, brand names got into it. You've got Mercedes here, how it started and how it's going with their concept cars. The more surprising the second photo, the better. And so as memes morph, as they do in, uh, in the cyber world uh, and the dumpster fire that 2020 was, you get how it started, how it's going in this case. And then they morphed again into how it started, how it ended. Uh, I particularly love this one. <laughs> Where the puppy survives, but the, the cute boy does not. Here was another one that I just loved. This is taken from Jurassic Park again, of course, how it started, how it ended with the T-Rex in the gift shop at Jurassic Park. What these do is they remember journeys, right? The ultimate in our life today of Holy Week is Palm Sunday. How it started with Jesus entering Jerusalem to the praise and adulation of all of the crowds and how it ended with Jesus walking through those same streets of Jerusalem opposite from the way he came in with the crowds crying for his crucifixion. We remember during this week that we are walking in Jesus' way and Jesus has frequently told his followers, hold any who would be his disciples, that our way would follow the same way 
as Jesus' story. Uh, Peter dramatically learned this is the case. Remember how it started with Peter, with the great catch of fish, with Jesus giving Simon, who uh, he called Simon by his first name, his given name three times in our story, telling Simon, you will be called Peter, the rock, remember? It just started so well. And how it ends, as we know in this week, will be with Peter weeping alone as he denies knowing his Lord and his Savior, the Messiah, three times. Peter and the disciples are told by Jesus, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. Now it's interesting, I don't know if you caught this in the reading, that Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you like wheat. He's talking to Simon, but the message is for all of the disciples. And just after arguing who is the greatest, typical of the disciples, he reminds them, and we remember that last week Jesus talked about how following him will mean to deny ourselves, to follow him. Jesus returns to a teaching that reminds him of this again. The greatest among you must be like the youngest. Remember how he was in the habit of pulling children forward to illustrate this, that the rulers are the greatest among you like one who serves, just as he showed up as one who serves, as we heard in our reading from Philippians, that the first will be last and the last will be first, as was mentioned on the week with the rich young ruler. And we might wonder why they launched into this discussion at dinner in the upper room just before this in the story. Jesus has told them that one of them would betray him. And somehow there's this tension, uh, this trauma leads into this conversation. It had to have been a brutal thing to hear. These men have been journeying for three years with Jesus. Remember, Jesus habitually sent his disciples out in pairs, in twos, like presumably Peter and John went together all the time because they continued to do that after the resurrection and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. One of these 12 used to journey with Judas. Did all of the miracles and the preaching and the work right alongside Judas. And there's not a clear reason given in the New Testament, a clear motive for why Judas betrayed, handed over Jesus. There's some hints of it in John's gospel, especially that Judas was uh, over enamored with money and stealing from the pot, but there's no clear witness. There's no clear uh, motive given, and we know how difficult that is, how much we want a motive. In the stories this week after that terrible shooting in Nashville uh, at the Covenant Presbyterian Church School, what we see over and over in the news is questions of the shooter's motive. We want to know why they do this. But with Judas, as in many cases, the why remains ambiguous. And in the face of this real world tension, that Judas is on the one hand entirely responsible for his choices. There's no question of that in the words that Jesus says. And at the same time, there's no question, according to the words and the teaching of Jesus, Jude, Jesus that the decision to hand Jesus over was determined by God. That Jesus' suffering and death is not random, but it is allowed and even ordained by God in a unique situation to fulfill Jesus' mission of saving the world from evil and from death. And oftentimes, holding stories next to each other gives us further insight when we hold the story of Jesus next to the awful events of this shooting in Nashville, where a shooter is entirely responsible for their actions, just as Judas was. And at the same time, the days of the lives of those who were killed were each written in God's book. And their length of days and their deaths are determined by God's loving sovereignty. Just as Jesus' life story, his betrayal, and his death are held together by the sovereign love of God. That's the mystery that we live in. I do not understand, we do not understand, 
how this mystery of God's loving sovereignty that holds all things for good and at the same time, human agency and human choice hold together. But what Jesus' story tells us is that God's will, God's determination to save his people and his commitment to their rescue cannot be thwarted by human actions on the side of evil. It seems the disciples veered away from this painful mystery into a discussion of who is greatest. Presumably, who would have no chance of going down that road to betrayal because they're just too good? And Jesus calls them back to his own example of service and also to the good news of the kingdom. He gives them this consolation before also giving them the warning about Satan seeking to sift them like wheat. So the trials, this sifting like wheat of the disciples comes down to this. Will Jesus' disciples, Jesus' followers, remain loyal to Jesus in those times when evil has the upper hand, in times of risk of threat, in times of great loss and of grief, in times of personal fear and of failure? Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. It's interesting because the Greek here originally for Satan has requested or Satan has asked. This verb means to not only ask but to receive permission. This isn't like me asking Clint to hand me that Bible, right? This is me asking someone who has a great deal more sovereign control of my life, ultimate sovereign control for permission to do something. Do you remember the story of Job? Do you remember the story? The story of Job opens with a scene in the throne room of heaven. And we are told in this story, as all of the heavenly beings are congregating before God on God's throne, that the Satan, the Satan, the accuser, comes also before God's throne, says he's been wandering the earth. He sees this man, Job. And basically he says, the only reason this guy stays faithful to you is you don't take anything away from him. You're good to him. You blessed him. You start taking things away, he's going to curse you. This is the accuser. This is what the Satan, the accuser of the brethren, does, is attempts to accuse God's faithful in the presence of God. The biblical story, you see, rejects the idea that there are equal and opposing forces of good and evil battling out for supremacy. The biblical story says that is not true. There is a Lord and a God and a creator whose good purposes are supreme. And any other power in this world, any other power in this world, is under the supreme and sovereignty of that good God and creator. Satan could not undertake his work of putting Jesus' disciples under trial unless the Lord gave him permission. The wild card in this story, in Job's story, in every story, is whether or not human persons, people to whom God has entrusted genuine and actual agency in the world, genuine and actual power to act either for good or for evil, genuine and actual influence on the outcomes of the stories of human lives, whether or not The wild card is whether or not human persons will continue in times of sifting to choose for God when they are under extreme trial and testing. And in every single case except one, the answer is no. Ultimately, we are too weak and we are too frail to withstand the times of trial the time of testing. We just pray the Lord's Prayer and lead us not into temptation. The more accurate translation of that petition and lead us not into the time of trial. There is an ultimate trial. There is an ultimate testing that only one human person in the history of the world has ever withstood. And that person is Jesus of Nazareth. In every single case, 
And here the disciples who, as Jesus said in verse 28, have remained together with him in his trial, in his time of testing, they will scatter and they will fail him. Peter will deny him. Satan has asked and received permission to sift them like wheat. And it's a pattern we're all too familiar with as followers of Jesus. That as human persons, when we are sifted like wheat, we falter, we become fearful, we fail. We've seen this pattern with the disciples. The Gospels are honest but gracious about it. The how it's going memes that we could create in our imagination from the story so far. I mean, what would you put in your imagination for Simon Peter stepping out of the boat, how it's going, right? Walking on water, having a great time, and how it ended (laughs) sinking beneath the waves, right? The how it's going, the crowds following Jesus, listening to his teaching, so many that he has to stay on the move. And then one day in the story that we heard, how it's ended with most of them leaving and just 12 people standing there with him. The other story we heard, a young ruler showing up, taking a selfie with Jesus because Jesus loves him and he just gave a great answer and it looks good. And then walking away mournful and sad and grieving because he's very wealthy. The Messiah, the anointed of Christ, calling his disciples to pick up their cross daily and follow. Even Peter, again, his great moment, the how it's going of being the one to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. You remember this story? And then how it ended? Get thee behind me, Satan. Tempting. Siding on the one, with the one. Attempting to put Jesus under the test and the trial of denying God and God's ways and God's sovereignty and God's call in the world. In the case of Jesus and his disciples, it becomes clear over the next 24 hours is that Jesus of Nazareth is the only person ever who has the capacity to remain entirely loyal to God the Creator when the full weight of sin and evil, rebellion and death is placed on his shoulder. It becomes entirely clear that anyone who's had the capacity to withstand a time of trial or temptation has done so only because God has not allowed the full weight of sin and evil, of death, onto their shoulders. Jesus, whose death on the cross and whose resurrection are demonstration that he is the Messiah and the Lord He is the only one able to rescue others from the crushing weight of sin and of death. No person will ever face the same testing that Jesus undertook. And when Jesus warns his disciples about the sifting that they will face, in my imagination, you know how sometimes in like action movies or something there's an explosion and all the people who aren't right at the epicenter of the explosion get like blown backwards, right? This is what I imagine for Jesus' disciples. They love him. They are so ardent and desire so badly to stay with him no matter what. For three years, they have stayed with him no matter what. They remain with him as close as they can possibly get no matter what until the full weight of the betrayal and suffering and sin and evil of the world hits him, and then no one can withstand it. None of them, not even Peter, denying him three times in the courtyard. It's a profound demonstration of what Jesus carried on our behalf. And here's the good news. Jesus speaks it in verse 32. Did you hear it? I have pleaded, I have begged, in order that your faith will not fail And when you turn back, return and strengthen your brothers. Do you hear that? Peter's denial isn't the destruction of his faith. His faith is what will save him. Jesus knows. Jesus has pleaded and he has begged and he has given his grace for Peter to turn back. Jesus is certain that the outcome of his own pleading on Peter's behalf is that Peter's faith will turn Peter around. That's faith. Don't think that faith is being with able, able to withstand everything all the time. 
because we won't. Faith turns back. Faith is a gift. This is what's essential. A person's endurance, a person's resolve, a person's determination can still result in failure. Your best resolve, your best determination, your most humble reliance on God and Jesus Christ can and at times will still result in your failure as a disciple. It will for all of us. But the gift of God is faith. The gift of God is Jesus pleading and intercession on our behalf. The gift of God is faith that strengthens and turns us around because of Jesus' intercession. This is what sifting like wheat teaches us about faith. Our faith is not strengthened by our own efforts and resolve. Our faith is strengthened because Jesus pleads for us. Jesus intercedes for us. Jesus' entire life is a plea for our faith not to fail. I mean, consider Jesus' how it started and how it's going moments, right? How it started with his birth and the Magi coming and laying their, their gifts at his feet, the entire world kneeling before him in that moment. And then how did that end? Egypt, fleeing. Jesus' teaching and healing and demonstrations of power is how it started. And then the rejection by all of the religious authorities who accused him of working for the devil, how it ended. Jesus' teaching and crowds and delight in how it started, and then many, if not most, turning away when it got too hard. And then this week, as we've already said, Jesus entering Jerusalem to the Hosanna of the crowds and the recognition that their king and their Messiah was present in this man and how it ended with being turned over, and rejected, suffering, and death. This story should be a how it started and how it ended story, like the woman with the puppy. But here's the good news, and why we know that Jesus pleading on behalf of Peter and pleading on our behalf is effective and powerful to save, because how it ended was in the resurrection. How it ended was on Sunday. Jesus' resurrection changes moments that should be how it ended moments into how it's going experiences. Jesus' cross and resurrection has the power to change every single earthly how it ended moment into a how it's going experience. So faith is faith in Jesus' faithfulness in Jesus' endurance, in Jesus' death that pleads on our behalf. Faith in Jesus' victory has the power to transform our how it ended moments into how it's going. What are your how it ended moments? Who are the ones you've said goodbye to? What are the failures you will not change in your lifetime? Where are the places that you continue to struggle and fall. What are your how it ended moments? Hear this good news, that Jesus' death and resurrection changes every single how it ended moment into a how it's going. And he does it by giving us the gift in that resurrection of eternal life. We've seen this in every single one of our stories on this discipleship journey so far. The crowds going away from Jesus should have been a how it ended moment, but we heard it in, G in Peter's words. You have the words of eternal life. Sinking is not how it ended. It Peter's sinking under the waves was transformed into how it's going because Jesus was sufficient to save. The young ruler leaving sad is not how it ends, but how it's going. How it ends is abundance for all of those who have left fields and family and wealth for Jesus and Jesus' mission because of treasures in heaven. And carrying the cross daily is not how it ends, it's how it's going. How it ends is sharing in Jesus' glory 
When he returns in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels, Jesus pleading on the disciples' behalf, Jesus pleading on our behalf from the cross and the resurrection is the grace that ensures that our faith will not fail, not because our faith is so strong, but because Jesus' faithfulness is sufficient. And it transforms every how it ended moment into a how it's going experience. This is why he says to his disciples in verse 29, I myself confer to you a kingdom as the Father has conferred it to me. That word, conferring to you, it's making a covenant. We're about to celebrate communion. When Jesus says, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. This has been sealed. I've made a covenant for you on this cross. This will happen. This is how it ends is that one day you will eat and drink with me at my table in the kingdom of heaven. And then he says to the 12, and I will put you on thrones to judge, which means to rule. This is how the wild card of human choice will end. At the table in the kingdom with Jesus Christ, ruling as humanity was meant to rule and steward and exercise authority at the beginning. You recognize this? So how do we live into this? How do you and I live into the how it's going of faith? I think there's three things. First of all, we need to receive the gift of Jesus' faithfulness, to believe and entrust ourselves to Jesus' work on the cross and the power of his resurrection. That this gift of faith that rescues us from sin and evil and death, this is the only the only place in power to turn every how it ended moment, including our own failures and our own deaths, into how it's going, into eternal life and the kingdom of heaven. So I want to invite you and encourage you to turn back as Peter did, because Jesus is pleading that you will pick up this faith, that you'll trust him, that you'll ask his forgiveness and accept his gift Secondly, I think we need to expect and to know that in trusting ourselves to following Jesus, that this is going to lead into times of trial and temptation. This will lead into this. Jesus warned his disciples that it would, that any time we seek to follow Jesus, who is the sovereign Lord, any power or temptation that refuses to bow to Jesus' sovereignty is going to resist you from within and without. We call these temptations and trials. I want to encourage you to pick up our discipleship journey for Holy Week and for the week after and Easter to learn what it means, what Jesus taught the 12 disciples about how to withstand through the grace and the power of Jesus' cross and resurrection, the trials and temptations that will come our way as those who seek to follow him knowing that Jesus is pleading for us and gives the grace to resist. And then finally, the third thing, the first is to turn to Jesus, return in faith. The second is to learn from Jesus how to walk through trials and temptations. And do you catch the last thing that Jesus told Peter to do? Strengthen the brothers. Strengthen the brothers and sisters. This is why we meet in connect groups. It's not so we can have tea and make friends, although that's very nice, right? We never have tea in our connect group, actually. We have coffee. The reason we meet in connect groups is because we need each other strengthening. This is too much. This is too much to do alone. We need a place where we can talk through our trials and the temptations, the pressures of what it is to follow Jesus in this world. Peter wrote years later in 1 Peter 5.10, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Jesus Christ. And I believe if you are here and you are hearing the sermon that you are called to that eternal grace in Jesus Christ. After you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast. That's what God intends to do. And God does that means of grace, gives that means of grace through one another. This is the calling of our connect groups. To be a place where we are welcomed and turned back. Turning back is a sign that Peter's faith did not fail. 
that Jesus' prayer was answered. And we've got to pay attention to this with each other, to give each other spaces to turn back, where we know we will not be judged, we will not be condemned, we will not be left outside because we denied Jesus three times, but we'll be welcomed back into a place where this gospel of Jesus' faithfulness is at the center, where we learn together what it means that our how it ended moments are how it's going moments. And we'll share with each other through how it's going to be the means of grace through which God restores and makes strong and makes firm and makes steadfast again. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we know, we believe, we confess with our mouths the power of your cross and your resurrection to defeat the powers of evil and sin and death in this world powers that seek to claim control of the story of this world. We know the way that these powers insist that their work is how it ends. But we trust the power of your cross. We trust you when you said it is finished. We trust you after the resurrection when you declared that you are establishing your kingdom and you entrusted it to us. We trust you that you have the grace and the power to turn every one of our endings into a how it's going. And we pray by the grace of your Holy Spirit that you give us a vision for your eternal kingdom, that you give us a vision for eternal life, that you give us a vision for the resurrection from the dead. This is good news, Lord Jesus. And we long to live into it in your name. Amen.